I'm Mike Bavona, and I live in uh, Pauley's Island, the River Club. Uh, and I've lived there for about, uh, for about 14 years now. I'm originally from New Jersey, Rutherford, New Jersey, and uh, spent most of my time in Red Bank, New Jersey. And then in the mid-80s, I moved to a little seaport town in North Carolina called Oriental primarily because of sailing. Sail, we were doing a lot of sailing in those days. And it was a lovely uh, change, huge change for me. Because I had been uh, in the uh, brokerage business before that for about 25 years. And it was uh, quite interesting to live there in a small town. It was small, I mean, seven, 800 people when I lived there, but I really, really enjoyed it. And uh, from there, then we moved on to down here. I came from a small town in Rutherford, New Jersey, and um, it was a commuter town. As a matter of fact, you could see the skyline of New York right across the Meadowlands in those days. And I was 14 years old. I was born in 1927. And when uh, war was declared, the uh, Pearl Harbor, I, was, I guess I'd be 14. And uh, I remember very vividly the announcement being made and I can also remember my mother uh, grabbing hold of me, and I didn't realize at the time the significance, because uh, everything was just a blur to a 14-year-old. And of course, in, uh, in the 40s, when you were 14, 15, 16, you were a kid, not like today. You were a lot younger in experience. I think you had more positive things. You had more things to do, more leisure time. <laughs> and anyway, I um, was from a large family in Rutherford. The Bavonas were all over Rutherford. And Lyndhurst, they were uh, my uncles, my aunts. They had businesses, they were lawyers, they were judges. And I came along at a time when I was the only child in a family that was the only one that was playing sports primarily football and baseball. And all of my uncles and everybody had been all state people. So quite frankly, I was spoiled rotten. I was really, and um, my father had a drugstore. He was a pharmacist, he never went to college. But in those days you could uh, get your license to practice pharmacy at night. My father was a, my father's parents came over from, from Italy. My mother was French and Irish. Her name was Flavel, lovely person. And um, the um, impact of the war, of course, on the beginning was absolutely nothing. I mean, we, it was just one of those events. It was horrible, I suppose, to some people. But as the years went by and very quickly, uh, I learned about it the hard way. As a matter of fact, it's rather odd because the reason why I joined and kept pressing my parents to join the service was because of my father's business. And that was because my mother and father worked at the drugstore seven days a week. They couldn't get help. And the pharmacy was a, a, a central place. Of, he was a real, true drugstore, not like today. They, prescriptions and patent medicines. And my father, I don't know how many, he had three or four pharmacists working for him if he could get them. We, we, we delivered a lot of nerve tonic <laughs> in those days. But one of the things that I was telling the young lady downstairs that was the most, one of the things I'll, I'll always remember in my 14, 15, and 16 year old years, was that my father had a telex machine in the drugstore. And I soon learned that every time it rang four times, it was a death, and a telegram had to be delivered. Three times was wounded in action, and missing in action. And my father, who I thought was a very tough guy, he was a tough guy, but my father had to deliver these. And what he would do is uh, try to find a priest or someone in the family that he was delivering to. 
and on several occasions I went with him and uh, I watched him walk up to the door and uh, I never would, would leave the car but the screams of those people the uh, anguish uh, has been with me all ever since and it got I had to deliver orders because my father couldn't get help as I said and my dad played poker with the police chief and so I had I had the right to drive, not the right, but I was allowed to drive the delivery truck, little car, little Willie's Jeep, to make these deliveries of prescriptions after school. I hated it. But what I hated most was those occasions where I had to go out on these uh, missions. Uh, it was, people say, when I say that, I had thought about it many years ago, they said, well, that's impossible. That's, not the way they do things now, but that's the way they did things then. There were so many of them, so many. I can remember when I was 14 or 15 being at the Rex Theater in Rutherford, uh, watching a movie of some sort, and uh, I think it was the Path A News would come on, and somebody would yell and scream, and they would stop the film. It happened more than once, because there on the film, was one of our people from Rutherford or Lindhurst or East Rutherford, oh my goodness, a pandemonium broke loose, you know, that kind of an atmosphere. And uh, so finally I, my father agreed and my mother agreed to let me go into the service and, uh, after football season of 44. Had to play football first. <laughs> and um, we, they would come into the school the, the, the military. The, so, and one of the things I did remember was there was this guy that came in in dress blues and uh, he was started talking about PT boats. Yeah, boy, oh boy. We didn't know anything about Kennedy at that time, of course, but he talked about this marvelous going across the water on this 87-foot boat. And I said, that's for me. Because I lived two blocks from the Passaic River which quite frankly in those days was a cesspool. But I swam in it anyhow, all the kids did, and I drove my mother nuts. And I liked small boats, I've always been around them or something, worked at a, you know, the boat yard after school. And my father, when the day came to uh, finally talk about going, and the day came to go, and uh, my mother didn't come to the bus, but my, I finally realized that my father was not such a tough guy. Because the first time I ever in my life saw him cry. But the, uh, I don't think it's hard, I don't even try to try and describe to my children or anybody what it was like to be in a wartime situation, a world war in a small town when everything was black and white. The whole town turned out for our leaving with the high school band, the buses and everything. Most of the town was there in the town square. And I can remember my father walking away and he said to me one final thing, he said, you know, you know, Mike, I know how you are. Don't volunteer for anything. Keep your mouth shut for a change. Okay, you got it. And I was, got on a train and the next thing I know, I'd never been out of Rutherford, let alone oh, maybe Lyndhurst. And I ended up at a, uh, at a naval training base in Sampson, it was called in those days, which was in the uh, Finger Lakes of New York State, near Geneva, New York. Marvelous, right on Lake Seneca. I'd never seen anything like it before in my life. Beautiful. And there were 110 of us, all from New York and Brooklyn. And we're up there in these barracks, which are barracks, buildings, 110 people, and we're all waiting, and in walks our guy that's going to be the chief, who's going to be our leader, and his name is, he announced to us very quickly, my name is Chief Nunez, I'm from Baton Rouge, Louisiana, and I don't like you boys, right off the beat, just so you know, and in, in about 10, 14 weeks, whatever it takes, I'm going to break you, and you're going to hate me. Well, I'll tell you one thing, he, um, 
he broke us the right way. We were the rooster company. We know how we knew we were the best. And uh, also, it was good for me because a little chip came very quickly off my shoulder, and I wasn't the smart ass that I was or the big shot that I thought I was in high school. Along with a lot of others, we were streetwise kids from the city. You know, we were all tough guys. Well, you're not tough. Relatively tough. And it turned out that we won a, um, uh, a pass to Geneva, New York. I'm probably talking about too long, but I mean, it, it all ties together. And in that town of Geneva was a, I walked on a college campus and it was Hobart College, Geneva, New York. I'd never heard of it, of course, but it was beautiful. It was the, uh, it was the, the epitome of what you'd think a college should be, you know, the ivy colored quad, beautiful buildings and all of that. And I said, God, I'd love to come here, but that's another story. So uh, we got back in the base and uh, they asked for volunteers. We need people for submarines and PT boats. Old Mike's hand goes right up. I said, my dad's gonna shoot me. But I volunteered for both. And they gave us a series of tests, which um, about night blindness and other things. It was a quite complete tests. It became apparent that some of the tests uh, showed that I was claustrophobic. The submarine was not gonna, and I were not gonna get along. So I volunteered for PT boats. And uh, one thing while I think about it, uh, Rutherford was a known football power for years. We were always state champs. If we lost one game a year, it was a disaster. And because of our coach, Eddie Tryon, who was an All-American at Colgate, he'd been there for 28 years. And uh, I wrote my mother, of course, about visiting Hobart College, I think it was, and, everything else, and uh, she wrote me back that Eddie Tryon, the town was uh, in mourning because Eddie Tryon was leaving. He's going to a small college in upstate New York. Believe it or not, he's going to Hobart College. I wrote my mother, that's where I want to go. I got to find some way to uh, graduate from high school and go to Hobart College. They sent us to uh, Boston first from Samson. I can remember coming home from Samson. They gave us a pass, and I can't tell you the feeling that you had coming with your Navy uniform into this town with these just adoring people. I mean, all of us, not, you know, all of us. From, and we really felt that we're going to make it the big difference here, of course. We didn't know what the hell we were talking about, but it sounded good. Of course, at that time when I got back, I noticed a lot of gold stars in the windows. My mother and father, you know, in a very short time, they really looked older to me, and they were under tremendous strain. Remember, they went through, from the old country, they went uh, through a depression. They went through World War I. They make a, a life for themselves only to see their only son go off to war. That's what all parents did at that time. They're real heroes. And uh, I got to um, Boston and got my first taste of what war was really about. I had to visit a friend at Boston, uh, Chelsea Naval Hospital. In order to get to where he was, I had to walk through a ward of uh, amputees. It seemed to me it never ended. I was in the wrong place. And uh, it struck me here, I'm 17 years old, and they, this is for real. Yeah. Look at these kids here, my peers, my peers. Legs, no legs, no arms, legs, legs. All the way through this hall, I thought I'd never, I didn't know what to do. Ah, oh, God, and um, then uh, I went to, uh, got on the boats in Melville, Rhode Island. They sent me there, and that was our home base, Squadron, no, squadron Four, Ron Four. And uh, we were a uh, frontier base because during the, Euro the European War was not over yet. 
I think it was over when, in 45, uh, 45 in May, maybe, or after the Battle of the Bulge. It was sometime in that time. And what our assignment was to train on the boats and then go out and pick up and, let, and uh, relieve the DEs that were bringing convoys in and escorting them to the various ports. And um, the first ride on a PT boat at 17 years old down the Narragansett Bay is something that is beyond thrilling. I mean, it is hard to describe the feeling. And uh, it was very informal. I think our squadron commander was a Lieutenant G.G. <laughs> uh, everybody aboard the boat did um, all the duties. Our boat uh, had uh, three 1,500 horsepower Allison engines, can you imagine? And uh, on an 87-foot boat, and, uh, 40 millimeter in the bow and uh, 20 millimeter, had a lot of armament quad 50 machine guns and no tubes, no but torpedo tubes. We never hit anything with a torpedo, but when we practiced, you had to, uh, <laughs> you'd, the guy would, the skipper would give you the sign and you'd pull the lever, which would release it, and at the same time, you would push your hand down on the top of it and that would start it. That's the, and over the side it went, bank away. And uh, the worst duty on the boat was the Motormax job, which everybody had to do. You had to sit over the middle engine in a little chair. And you had your gear shift levers. That's the way you controlled the boat. The only thing that the skipper could control were throttles. This was so primitive in those days that if he wanted to go in reverse or something, you had to pull the lever, of course, and you had to sit over the engine to do it. I didn't like that job. Noisy, oily, greasy. And, uh, but loving every minute of it because we uh, were getting ready to go to Newark Bay. The, there was a plant in Newark Bay. PT boats were made primarily by Elko Company in Newark Bay. And I think it was Huckins or Higgins in New Orleans. We had a Huckins boat, and we had a uh, Elko boat which was, um, and we were supposed to pick up new boats and uh, bring and go down to Miami and train. And we're going to put the boats, we started decommissioning our base because we operated on there all the way through 45. And uh, although it wasn't officially said, we felt that we were getting ready for the invasion of Japan. We were going to go to Pearl Harbor first and then all of this business. And uh, then the war was, then the, this magic bomb went off and everything changed. And um, the, um, the, um, that was the end of it except that of course, they, they took our whole unit and uh, disbanded it. And we had to, uh, I know we had to destroy a lot of the equipment. It broke our hearts. We had to sink some boats. And because uh, they were, it's an enduring group when you're so close together. We had a crew of about 12 on the boat and really got close to each other. And um, I, uh, we were sent to General Sea Detail in Norfolk. Lost our rating. I was a quartermaster third class, and they brought me back down to a human first class. And then, in um, while waiting to go, I was supposed to go on a cruise to. Uh, Italy, I think, on a cruiser or something. And as luck would have it, a friend who knew my father was ship's company there. And he said, I'm going to do you a favor. You're going to stay in here. I'm going to make you ship's company. And you're going to be discharged. 
be home for Christmas. Well, what he didn't know, he made me ship company, all right, but what he didn't know was that they froze us all to do to to discharge everybody else. And I am cursing. <laughs> Then they did something which uh, was kind of hard on you. Uh, I think it was a week before Christmas. They said, uh, you have your choice, all you guys. I'm counting points. I don't know if you were familiar with it. You had so many points that you had to get to be discharged, and it was in your docket. And you had so many points for overseas, so many points for this duty and that duty. Well, I was one of the people that were counting up points with a hell of a lot less points than I had, <laughs> and they're going home. And I really wanted to get home. And um, I also found out in Norfolk something that really moved me in a way, and still does, that going back to boot camp, um, there were about 35 or 40 of us who went and took the examinations for the PT boats and the submarines. Of those people, about eight or nine of us passed the tests going either way. I learned subsequently in Norfolk that the rest of us, all of the guys I was with boot camp with, were s sent in general sea detail to a heavy cruiser. And I forget the name, I used to know the name of it, but they were kamikaze I think in either Okinawa or probably, or later, and a lot of them were killed. And I um, really, when I found out, a chill went through me because if I, La Forza del Destino in a way, you know, in a, you feel that there's a force of destiny, uh, that if I hadn't volunteered and if I hadn't gone on PT boats, uh, maybe I would have been one of them. And uh, I didn't get home and they gave you your choice in Norfolk of either joining the Naval Reserve, you'll be home for Christmas, or completely out, and you'll have to wait. So I decided to wait. And I spent Christmas down there, which was not a big deal, because when I finally did get home, uh, the town of Rutherford and East Rutherford and Karlstadt and Lyndhurst were ravaged with young men like myself who did not return. And if they did return, they were, they were uh, amputees. But I think something that people forget also, and I remember seeing it for years afterwards. Uh, let me, I, I went to a junior high school, a junior college, got my high school equivalency and entered the class of 47 of Hobart, played and graduated Hobart College, and uh, played for Eddie Tryon for four years. And, and uh, when I got out of college, I was still living with my parents, and who had since lived, moved to Oradell, but I went back to Rutherford quite a few times. And there were people young people, again like myself and older, who still couldn't get over the war five or six years after, still were in their fatigues, still were going who had, that event was so overpowering to them, so moving, and for a lot of reasons was the highlight of their life, unfortunately. It was, don't get me wrong, it was a big part of my life. And I always felt very sorry for them to see them at the American Legion or something, still in, or at the local bar somewhere, reliving this war five, six, seven, ten years afterwards. When I went, I, I got married and moved to Red Bank, New Jersey uh, afterwards. And the same thing happened there, that the remnants of the war and the degree of alcoholism and of other abuses and uh, the aftermath of the people that had been not physically wounded, but mentally wounded, carried on to a huge degree, huge degree. And um, I am so thankful 
of my time when I lived, of being able to be a very, very small part of that experience because it, it is part of the elixir of life. It is part of the, uh, I hope, some of the building blocks that maybe made you consider uh, the perils of, of this kind of thing. Of, uh, and the stories that I heard from uh, people, I mean, uh, when I saw a part of, I couldn't watch all of Ken Burns' The War, for example, several things of it, because I had heard these stories and really didn't believe them from men that had been there. I know kids that had been there, I talked to. I graduated from college and I've always thought that um, Hobart College meant an awful lot to me also because of, I've had some things happen that have, for example, I was a stutterer. Joe Biden and I have one thing in common. <laughs> I happen to know that Joe Biden, I don't want to get political, but Joe Biden was a stutterer also. And when I read that somewhere, I said, well, I can, that's nice. Anyway, and it, interestingly enough, I was a stutterer because I am severely left-handed. And when I went to school, you couldn't write left-handed. No way. Not in the Rutherford school system. You had to write right-handed. And so, as a result of that, about in August of every year, it seemed to me for three or four years, I would get a very bad rash right here. And I would start to stutter a little bit. And it, nobody knew what it was about. And in those days, the only thing you could do for that kind of a thing was to put gentian violet on it. You know what gentian violet looks like? It's purple. All right, you, cu you, you, you couple a big purple spot here with a young kid that can't say all the words. Put him with his peers. There's nothing but trouble. And it got worse and worse and worse until my family doctor said, you know, I think this is a psychosomatic thing. It's because he's so nervous or whatever. And he petitioned and got the, the school system to change me and I was the only person allowed to write. Of course, the desks were all right-handed. And it, the rash cleared up, but the stuttering went on all through school, high school. So I know what it means to be a lot of bloody noses, a lot of fighting, in a sense, a lot of uh, taunting. And when I hear bullying and taunting today, I am very, very moved by it because I, I can't, I wouldn't tolerate it with anyone. It's not good because I was bullied and, and had, didn't have the brains to back off. But um, anyway, that uh, uh, led to, it went on all through uh, the service, not severe, but there were certain words like breakfast. I can't tell you how long it took me to say the word breakfast. And when I did, it felt terrific. There was a woman in, in, uh, in, in uh, college, an uh, English teacher, who uh, saw this little problem that I had and maybe saw something else, I don't know. Because the thought of speaking was hard keep my mouth, you know, something in front of your face when you have a deformity or something. And uh, she, the, the thought of public speaking, of course, was, <laughs> you're, you gotta be kidding. In two years, she transformed that into that I was on the college play. <laughs> she did that, Hobart College. It made a big impact on me. Of course, it was a small school, uh, Hobart and William Smith together with, the, they had separate campuses. I think together we had 480 students. Magnificent place, still is today. And then I went from there and uh, I was wanted to be, uh, go on and get my master's at Columbia. And I took a, took a job. I was still living with my parents and I took a, a summer to a job after college. I played some, uh, I was uh, played a pretty good baseball player. 
There was a team in town called the Geneva Robins, which was class C, I think, or D, may C, I think. St. Louis Cardinals, so I played with them a little bit. And when I got home, uh, I took this summertime job at the Bendix Corporation as just a filler before the fall term. I spent 10 years there. <laughs> I gave up the idea of the Masters and spent 10 years with Bendix at Teterboro. And that they, they're the ones that were responsible for me going to Red Bank because there was a, a, a branch in Eatontown, New Jersey. And I went there. And I thought it was paradise. In those days it was. And that's where I learned how to fly. I learned how to fly in, um, in Teterboro, got a private ticket there. Only because it would, when you got out of working at Teterboro, the traffic was so bad, there was, you might as well do something else. And uh, in those days, of course, uh, Teterboro was a small, small airport, not, so, not what it is today. And then I always, through my father and my uh, uncle and everything else, had an interest in finance, in primarily stock brokerage. So that was, became my career. I spent 28 years uh, in the brokerage business as a stockbroker with um, various firms because this brokerage business was going through a metamorphosis. And you didn't have to change firms, just sit at your desk and the name would change. <laughs> One firm became another. I started out with Good Body and Company, which was a small carriage house firm, Fond Stock and Company. Edwards and Hanley, some of these are by the boards now, and finally ended up with Payne Weber. My parents and all parents were wonderful. When you think what they gave up. You know, they called us, I know they call us a great generation or one of the, but think of the great generation that, that you know, when Mike and I came home from the service when the war was over, I mean, it was just marvelous to, to go through that and to survive and because of breaks and everything else. My family, my mother's brother, was gassed at Bellow Wood in World War I. Um, he came back uh, with the inability to talk, control his face, and uh, terrible war, terrible, terrible thing. And, but he was a Pied Piper to the children in Rutherford because he had magical hands. Uncle Eddie could build anything, and he built toys for kids in the back. The only thing that he did that my mother never forgave him for was that he built his own airplane himself. And guess who he took up on its maiden's flight? It was me. He took me to Teterboro, and we got into this airplane. That's what started me thinking about one. <laughs> and we had, as I now, it was recalled later, we, he did the, the other major thing was he flew over my mother's house down the Passaic River. And my mother never forgave him. Don't you ever take my son Michael up in that, you know. He was a marvelous man. And to see what had happened to him and to see the way he was adored by the children in Rutherford looking past, the, and it was tough, looking past his, you know, his face and his expressions because he had such a magical way about him. Well, the family really, you know, they supped at labor's table. They all, they did. They had been through a lot of things. Because of events, because of, uh, of, Going to boot camp, going to hope, you know what I mean? One thing after meeting that teacher, like all of us have stories about a teacher that changed our lives. Well, here was one because of that time that she took with me. And then the, that kind of thing, you know, you say this was destined to be. I was very, very fortunate to have 
the place that I grew up in, at the time I grew up, to be have these experiences of the stuttering and the business and the I know what it means to fail at the plate. I know what it means to deliver a touchdown. So I've been in that arena. I played, uh, was captain of the baseball team in Hobart and football team, and uh, not captain, but I played four years. And uh, that education and those experiences, uh, I think helps an awful lot in you being, uh, uh, helps you in your life. You hope that it helps you to be a better person. And I just wonder sometimes if it wouldn't be good for us to have our young people some way have half of the experiences that we had in that sense. I think it would be marvelous. I don't think, I think paying your dues in that way is one of the building blocks of, of, of building a good character and a good Good, good country. I'm concerned about this country right now. <laughs>